The story starts with an interesting rumor. It's about a man in this world that even the most dangerous mercenaries and armed groups on the planet are afraid of whenever they see him. From the story, we can tell that this dreaded figure isn't one to be messed with. His name is Peter, and he's as dangerous as they come. However, the surprising thing about this killer is that he's an elderly man in his 60s. For many years, Peter was notorious for his ability to kill anyone he fought, but age finally caught up with him. It looks like things would have been better for him if he had just died years ago. Unfortunately for him, he's now being hunted down by thousands of dangerous bounty hunters, and he has also lost all of the assets he acquired over the years. The fact that he's constantly being chased around is starting to threaten his loyalty to the organization he works for even though he's basically a legend among them. The scene shifts, and we see Peter standing over a sea of men he killed. There's only one guy left, and he recognizes the man standing before him as the legendary Peter, even though Peter is wearing a funny mascot head. It doesn't make him any less terrifying to the man. The bloody man admits that he can't understand how Peter is still alive, even when he's being hunted and tracked down by hundreds of thousands of killers. He's baffled that the assassin keeps managing to evade all the people who want to kill him and keeps staying off their radar. Peter just walks towards the man calmly. The man knows he is probably going to be killed, and our hero tells him that the reason they would never catch him, even though thousands of them seek him out, is that the Peter they're looking for is no longer who he used to be. Just then, he takes off the mascot mask, and the man is shocked when he sees the face that gets revealed. The man can't believe his eyes and even thinks that what he's seeing is impossible. But Peter just casually points his gun at the man while smoking a cigarette, and it doesn't take too much guessing to know what happens next. The scene shifts to three months earlier, and we see Peter at his bookstore. He receives a call from someone advising him to stop ignoring the calls and go in for a hospital visit person on the other end then reminds Peter that he will die in less than three months. Despite all of this, it doesn't seem like Peter's mind is going to change. We see him gathering his mountain of pills, and afterward, he proceeds to arrange the books in the store. Peter isn't afraid of death, especially since the very word is the name of his profession. He thinks about how he gave the last 50 years of his life to the organization, and admits that he doesn't regret a single thing in his life. He looks at one of the books that teach how to take a portrait photo, and realizes that he's never taken a picture of himself before. That makes the old man look in a mirror while carrying a pile of books, and he sees how much he has aged. A while later, a schoolgirl walks into the store looking to buy some middle school textbooks. When Peter hears her voice, he quickly switches from his dull and miserable mood to a more <laughs> vibrant, customer-friendly persona. As he helps her find the textbooks she needs, his eyes hold a glimmer of something more profound beneath the surface. Peter welcomed the girl with a warm <laughs> smile as she entered his quaint little bookstore. Sunlight filtered through the dusty windows, casting a soft golden glow over the rows of books that lined the shelves. The tinkling of a small bell above the door echoed in the air, announcing her arrival. Peter's eyes crinkled at the corners as he cracked a joke to ease the girl's nerves, setting the tone for their encounter. The girl, her curiosity piqued, looked around the store, her eyes wide with wonder. She asked Peter if he sold used textbooks, her voice tinged with a touch of uncertainty. The old man, his shop a treasure trove of knowledge spanning decades, beamed with pride as he began to explain. With a gentle gesture, Peter led her to a section of the store where books from the 1960s to 2020 stood in quiet companionship. Each book held stories, histories, and secrets of different worlds and times. He invited her to take a closer look, his eyes filled with a kind, reassuring warmth. His aged fingers brushed the spines, their textures whispering stories of the past, while his eyes twinkled with the promise of knowledge. The girl's heart swelled with gratitude, as Peter suggested she choose the latest textbook for her younger sibling. She spoke of her sibling with affection in her voice, revealing her love and care for them. Peter, a keen observer of people, took note of the girl's green name tag. With a knowing smile, he surmised that she must be a senior at the nearby high school, a simple nod from her confirmed his assumption. The girl marveled at how sharp Peter was, her admiration evident in her bright eyes. She couldn't help but ask how he knew so much about everyone in the neighborhood. Peter's response was calm and confident, as he explained that knowing everything about everyone was his special talent, a skill that had earned him the respect of the community. Suddenly, as if by magic, Peter produced a pack of brand new textbooks from behind the counter. The girl's eyes widened in surprise and disbelief. She had only a thousand one in her pocket, couldn't afford all of these brand new books. Peter, the epitome of kindness, flashed her a reassuring smile and told her she could have them because he no longer needed them. The girl's heart swelled with gratitude, but she hesitated, trying to refuse his generous offer. Old Peter, undeterred, tore the plastic wrapping off the books, making them no longer brand new. He insisted that it was perfectly fine and that he wanted to help. His eyes filled with wisdom and compassion, locked onto hers. Before we continue, take a moment to answer the question of the day. 
Who is the best assassin in Manhua? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. Now, back to the recap. Peter's keen intuition and perceptiveness allowed him to discern the love she held for her younger sibling just by the look in her eyes. He leaned in slightly and told her, his voice gentle, that she should cherish and care for them while she still had the chance. His words caught her off guard, and she felt a weight settle in her chest. The girl knew that Peter spoke from a place of experience, his words carrying a deeper meaning. He had seen the passage of time, the fleeting moments, and the regrets that could linger. With a nod, she acknowledged his wisdom, her eyes glistening with newfound understanding. Peter continued sorting out books, his hands moving with practiced ease. In a moment of familiarity, the girl accidentally called him Grandpa as she tried to get his attention. He chuckled warmly and suggested that she should simply call him Mr. Intrigued by the enigmatic man before her, the girl couldn't help but inquire if he had ever experienced regret in his own life. Peter paused, his gaze shifting to a distant memory. He spoke of how regrets tend to accumulate with age, like pebbles in a jar, each one holding a piece of one's history. As Peter's eyes welled up with emotion, he began to recount a painful memory from his past. It was a time when he had to make a heart-wrenching decision to leave his daughter behind to ensure her survival. The memory was etched in his soul, a reminder that the past could never be changed, no matter how deep the regrets ran. As the weight of Peter's words settled upon her, the girl contemplated her actions. The old man's advice echoed in her mind, urging her to return home and take care of her younger sibling rather than proceeding down a dark path of regret. Her conflicted emotions danced across her face, revealing her inner turmoil. But just as the girl hesitated, a sudden shift in the air hinted at an impending danger. Peter's instincts had been on high alert, and he already knew that she had been sent here to end his life. His calm demeanor belied the depth of his understanding as he implored her to turn away, offering her the promise of safety. The girl, her eyes wide with astonishment, couldn't fathom how Peter had uncovered her intentions. He explained that he had memorized the faces of every student at the high school she claimed to attend. It was a chilling realization for her, a testament to the depths of his knowledge. With dawning awareness, the girl realized that she had been outsmarted, but instead of feeling creeped out, a surge of fear coursed through her veins. Peter then took her further aback by pointing out that the knife she carried carried the unmistakable scent of blood, a scent he had encountered throughout many years of his life. He mocked her futile attempt to mask the smell with cheap perfume. Despite her exposure, the girl was determined to carry out her mission. She brandished the knife, her resolve unwavering. However, a sudden wave of fear washed over her, causing her to doubt the outcome of this confrontation. It wasn't the old man she feared, but rather the fear of her own mortality. In the end, the girl chose not to engage with Peter any further. He assured her that she could still have the books, Acknowledging the sincerity of her words regarding her younger sibling, Peter recognized that she was from the same organization as he was, and the girl realized that her accidental use of honorifics had blown her cover. Suddenly, chaos erupted as two other men crashed through the store's roof, guns blazing. Peter's quick reflexes came to the fore as he pushed the girl out of harm's way. In their organization, the protocol was clear. If an assassin's mission failed, they were to be neutralized. As the bullets rained down, Peter took a hit, the searing pain tearing through his stomach. Blood stained his shirt as he fought back, firing shots in return. One of the assailants seized the girl, while the other relentlessly pummeled the old man with brutal punches. He couldn't fathom how such a seemingly feeble man could be the legendary assassin. In the midst of the chaos, a new figure emerged, adorned with bizarre octopus tattoos on his head, the eight-legged man. He was the boss's informant, and his words cut through the chaos like a blade. He spoke of Peter's unrivaled reputation within their organization, his status as the highest-ranked agent. Yet now, as he lay wounded and vulnerable on the floor, Peter seemed reduced to nothing. Peter, his face battered and bruised, demanded that they get straight to the point and reveal the reason they wanted to end his life. The eight-legged man, no longer mincing words, declared that their boss had developed an intense dislike for Peter. Confusion etched across Peter's face, prompting the informant to elaborate further. In a blunt and chilling tone, the eight-legged man explained that there was an astronomical bounty of 7.6 billion won on Peter's head, a staggering sum that would lure countless killers the moment he stepped outside the organization's sanctuary. Peter couldn't help but chuckle at the irony. It was the exact amount he had in his bank account. The informant confirmed that the bounty was, in fact, Peter's own money, money he had accumulated over the years while risking his life for the organization. Now, all that hard-earned wealth would fall into someone else's hands, and the eight-legged man harbored sinister intentions to claim it for himself. With a malevolent gleam in his eyes, the eight-legged man implored Peter to meet his demise at his hands. He struck Peter in the face, and the other assailant joined in the ruthless assault. The old man was sent hurtling into another room, 
and they assumed he had been incapacitated. Amidst the chaos, the eight-legged man expressed his disappointment that the fight had ended so quickly. He ordered his companions to clean up the aftermath while he approached the fallen Peter. However, the wily old man had one last trick up his sleeve. He unleashed a blinding flashbang, disorienting his attackers, and made his escape through the back door. Realizing they had been outwitted, the octopus man barked orders for his men to pursue Peter, who couldn't have gotten far with his grievous injury. The men ventured out into the rainy night, determined to track down their elusive target. Meanwhile, the eight-legged man stayed behind with the girl, their captive. Peter found refuge in a nearby playground, concealed amidst the children's toys. Rain fell steadily, mixing with his blood, creating a chilling tableau. Beaten and broken, he reflected on his inability to retaliate in that moment. The harsh reality of his old age finally descended upon him. He ruminated on a life that had never been truly his own, a life devoted to the organization from a tender age. While other children had been learning to read and write, Peter had been immersed in a world of violence, learning the art of becoming a cold-hearted killer. While they had been mastering social media platforms, he had been taught the intricate skills of wiretapping and eavesdropping until his ears bled. As Peter lay on the wet playground, the weight of his life's choices bore down upon him like an unrelenting storm. While others had been enjoying their youth, going on dates and finding love, he had already transformed into a Russian spy, enduring constant frostbite. When ordinary people were starting families, Peter had been locked in mortal combat amidst terrorist groups, fighting for his very survival. His entire existence had been dedicated to the organization, and he had faced death countless times. Yet, as he groaned in pain, he couldn't shake the feeling of betrayal. The organization he had sacrificed everything for now deemed him too old to continue. He felt discarded, cast aside like a forgotten relic. Peter had never sought wealth or recognition. He had merely wanted to serve their cause. To be treated as worthless in his twilight years wounded him deeply. A surge of determination coursed through his battered body. Peter refused to let them take his hard-earned money, but his thoughts of the daughter he had left behind many years ago filled his mind. Tears welled in his eyes. He crumbled once more, the weight of his past decisions crashing down upon him. With each labored breath, Peter realized that he couldn't bear to die such a miserable death. Summoning every ounce of strength left in him, he struggled to rise once more. However, when he thought of his daughter and the pain of their separation, couldn't find the will to fight any longer. He fell to the ground, surrendering to his fate. Finally, the legendary Peter stayed down, his lifeblood mingling with the rain that poured down on him. As his strength waned, he contemplated the life he had led and the choices he had made, fading into the obscurity of his regrets. Back at the eight-legged man's hideout, his two henchmen lamented their failure to claim the bounty on Peter. The second man, driven solely by the prospect of wealth, questioned why such a massive bounty had been placed on the old man's head. The first man, however, recognized the importance of respecting a legend like Peter. The second man's desire for the money was so fervent that he had even given up his kickboxing championship title to become a bounty hunter determined to kill the old man himself. Clutching a picture of Peter they had taken while on the roof, the second man vowed to achieve success after eliminating him. In that moment, a voice interrupted their conversation, revealing that the picture they held was the only existing image of Peter's face. Startled, the henchmen turned around, their shock evident as they saw Peter standing before them. However, there was something profoundly different about him now. For some inexplicable reason, Peter appeared to be a young man, and the henchmen struggled to believe it was the same person. They assumed he must be someone else wearing the same outfit. Peter himself couldn't explain the transformation, claiming that he had woken up in this new form. The bullet hole in his shirt served as evidence of his identity, but the second man remained skeptical, insisting that Peter had come to the wrong place. The henchman, still skeptical, but now assuming Peter was just a student who had mistakenly entered their territory, admonished him for being there. Enraged by their dismissive attitude, Peter grabbed the man's arm and demanded they take him to the eight-legged man immediately. Hearing Peter's request, the henchman jumped to the conclusion that the young man before them was also involved in their line of work. The second man ominously implied that eliminating him would reduce the competition. He attempted to punch Peter, but to his astonishment, Peter effortlessly stopped the fist with his palm. The man was bewildered by Peter's unexpected strength and began to wonder if he truly was the legendary figure. Undeterred, the second man attempted another punch, only to have Peter crush his knuckles with his bare hand. Meanwhile, the first man tried to sneak up on Peter from behind, but the quick-thinking young man swiftly turned around and delivered a series of blows while the man was still in mid-air. The second man, realizing the dire situation, grabbed a knife and questioned Peter about who had sent him. Calmly, Peter responded, noting that those who specialized in one weapon were merely third class. He continued, 
explaining that mastery of all weapons classified as second class, while those who could use anything as a weapon were first class. Seizing the nearby octopus tentacles, Peter wrapped them around his hands to fashion an improvised weapon. The second man charged at him with the knife, but Peter easily disarmed him using the tentacles. He swiftly looped them around the man's neck, applying pressure and strangling him. The defeated man, gasping for breath, remained on the ground, pleading with the assassin to reveal his identity. Peter, standing victorious, picked up the picture the henchman had taken of him and contemplated what the eight-legged man had told him about the consequences of leaving the organization. He confirmed if it was the only picture they had of him. When they nodded in agreement, he calmly burned it, lighting a cigarette. With the photograph reduced to ashes, Peter knew that even if a thousand men were after him, they would never find him. The old Peter they were hunting for was already dead. Meanwhile, in his car, the eight-legged man held the girl hostage, contemplating their next move. He knew that news of Peter being wanted would soon spread, and he was determined to capture him before anyone else. The eight-legged man acknowledged that Peter's condition was dire, and suggested that he show some kindness to his subordinates because of this realization. After leaving the eight-legged man's hideout, Peter found himself in a state of disbelief. He stared at his shirtless reflection in a mirror, bewildered by the inexplicable transformation that had turned him back into his younger self. The bullet wound that had once marred his waist was now gone, and even the agonizing pain from his cancer had vanished without a trace. He had no understanding of how this miraculous change had occurred, but he knew one thing for certain. He had to avoid being recognized by the numerous bounty hunters eager to claim his head. He understood that they would always track the signs he left behind, but never discover the old Peter they sought. Resolving to lay low, Peter decided to change his clothes. As he did, he overheard two thugs engaged in conversation nearby. His keen sense of responsibility prompted him to approach them and instruct them to take their cigarettes outside, as they were in a designated no-smoking area. The thugs, seeking to intimidate him, tried to push back. However, Peter stood his ground, insisting that they comply with the rules. The larger of the two thugs, feeling particularly brazen, slapped Peter and declared that he would let him off easy that day. Incensed by their insolence, Peter walked away, leaving the thugs believing that he was afraid of them. He reached the restroom door and locked it, announcing that he would handle the situation promptly. With menacing determination, Peter returned to confront the thugs, who remained confident in their ability to take him on. Rolling up his sleeves, he warned them that he was about to teach them a lesson for disrespecting their elders. The fat thug, growing increasingly frustrated, attempted to slap Peter again, but the assassin responded with a lightning-fast right hook to the side of the thug's torso. The first thug crumpled to the ground, unconscious. The second thug, undeterred, pulled out a knife and tried to intimidate Peter, demanding if he knew who he was dealing with. Peter calmly admitted that he didn't know him personally, but noted that he was holding his pocket knife the wrong way. The thug, perplexed, asked for an explanation, and Peter pointed out that he would cut himself if he swung the knife as he was currently holding it. Growing tired of the back and forth, the frustrated thug swung the knife at Peter, only to have it disarmed with ease. In a swift motion, Peter struck him on the neck, causing him to fall to the ground, clutching his injured throat. Fearful and overmatched, the thug began to realize the extent of Peter's skills and inquired about his identity. Peter, not knowing the nature of the thug's illegal activities, sternly warned him that he would have to die if he revealed his own identity. He proceeded to strip the thug of his clothes and left him naked in the restroom, extracting a promise that the man would turn to legal activities from that point onward. With his pride shattered and his options limited, the defeated thug reluctantly agreed to the terms. As Peter left the confrontation with the two thugs, he decided to check his bank account. To his utter dismay, he discovered that all of his hard-earned money had mysteriously vanished. This unexpected turn of events left him even more perplexed and concerned about his current situation. While walking away, he overheard a conversation between two students discussing a scholarship. It triggered a flood of memories from his past, memories of a place called the Glory Orphanage, operated by a religious institution, it was the place where Peter had grown up. It had been fifty long years since he had left, and he learned that the orphanage had transformed into a massive cartel known as the Glory Club. This organization had spread its influence throughout the political and business world, and it was the same organization Peter had been a part of for many years. Now, he was determined to bring it down with his own hands. Meanwhile, the eight-legged man paid a visit to a cold storage facility where meat was kept. The smug man he had come to confront asked if he had come alone to deal with him, but the hitman was already overqualified for such encounters. The target, confident that the people at the Glory Club would meet their end sooner or later by trusting in Peter, attempted to engage in conversation. However, the eight-legged man showed little interest in prolonging the discussion. He simply wanted to get the job done. Before any action could unfold, the eight-legged man found himself surrounded by men armed with knives. 
turned out that this place served as the base of operations for the Wagner mercenaries, renowned as the best private military company in the entire West. Despite being outnumbered and facing a perilous situation, the eight-legged man remained unfazed, leaving the leader of the mercenaries perplexed. The mercenary leader questioned the hitman's confidence, wondering why he would be so sure of himself in the face of overwhelming odds. He ordered his men to confront their uninvited guest, and they charged at the eight-legged man with determination. However, their efforts proved futile as the hitman swiftly defeated the mercenaries using his signature skill, full-body hypermobility. The leader of the mercenaries watched in terror as the eight-legged man's body twisted and contorted to incapacitate his men. Desperate, he yelled for the incredibly flexible killer to stay away from him, but his pleas fell on deaf ears. The hitman completed his assignment without hesitation. Upon his return to his hideout with the girl from earlier, the eight-legged man was met with a grim sight. His men had been brutally murdered, the cameras destroyed, and no evidence of a weapon remained. In that moment, he could only conclude that the attacker responsible for this carnage could be none other than Peter. The eight-legged man couldn't help but wonder about the mysterious tricks that had kept Peter alive and enabled him to eliminate his men despite his compromised condition. Nevertheless, his determination to be the one to kill Peter before the bounty dropped remained unwavering. He sent the girl to report back to him as soon as she discovered Peter's whereabouts, though her thoughts lingered on the kind old man who had valiantly saved her from the ambush back at the bookstore. With orders being absolute, the girl reluctantly accepted the task from her superior. As they entered a restaurant, the two subordinates were surprised to find someone waiting for them inside. A young man sat at one of the tables, and the eight-legged man assumed he was a customer, informing him that they were closed for the day. He inquired about the young man's purpose and whether he had made a prior reservation. Peter, looking up at them, calmly explained that he did not have a reservation. However, he admitted to coming with a deep grudge. Perplexed, the eight-legged man asked if it was related to an outstanding tab from the past. Peter replied, stating that it was somewhat correct, but his tab was far more substantial, a staggering 7.6 billion won. Initially, the eight-legged man believed it was a jest, but fear quickly gripped him as the realization dawned on him. He swiftly ordered his men to lock the restaurant doors, preparing for a confrontation. The eight-legged man engaged Peter in conversation, attempting to deduce the young man's connection to Peter and how he had come to possess such knowledge. Upon closer examination, he confirmed that the young man was not a member of their organization. Even more concerning, he had no information about this enigmatic figure or what he might be planning. As one of his subordinates readied his gun, the eight-legged man contemplated whether the young man could be Peter's secret child or disciple. However, he quickly dismissed the notion, recalling that Peter had always operated alone. Unable to determine the young man's identity, the eight-legged man offered him two options. The first was to reveal Peter's whereabouts and leave the restaurant alive, while the second was to resist and meet his end with a bullet to the head. Peter, taunting the eight-legged man, pretended to consider the options before defiantly declaring that he didn't need any of them. The octopus-headed hitman grew increasingly agitated, but little did he know that Peter had a third option in mind. As Peter calmly stood his ground, a smug and confident look adorned his face. With an air of self-assuredness, he finally revealed his name to the eight-legged man. In a tone that oozed arrogance, he declared, My name is Peter, and heaven forbid, none of my targets have ever lived to tell the tale. At the utterance of that name, the story took a dramatic turn. Without hesitation, Peter informed the eight-legged man that he was, in fact, the legendary Peter they had been relentlessly pursuing. He even confessed to being the one responsible for the demise of the hitman's subordinates. This revelation left the eight-legged man completely bewildered, as it defied all reason. The Peter he knew was an elderly man, so he incredulously questioned the young man before him, seeking an explanation for this inconceivable turn of events. Peter, maintaining his smug demeanor, responded with a snide comment, implying that the eight-legged man might be deaf. He reiterated his admission of responsibility for the henchmen's deaths. However, the eight-legged man remained uncertain and struggled to comprehend the situation. He couldn't believe that the person sitting in front of him could truly be Peter. Engaging in a mental debate, he questioned the young man's identity and motives for attacking them. Growing impatient and sensing that things were about to escalate, the eight-legged man called out to Peter, still believing him to be an ordinary student. He issued a stern threat while the high school girl and the waiter brandished their weapons. Demanding that Peter reveal his true relationship to the elderly man they were searching for, the eight-legged man watched intently as the girl prepared for a fight. In response, Peter proposed a method to determine their true connection. When the eight-legged man inquired about this method, Peter delivered a chilling response. He would have to kill him. A wide grin spread across the octopus-headed hitman's face, finding the proposition convenient. 
as killing was his specialty. He signaled the waiter to shoot Peter, instructing him to ensure that Peter could still breathe after getting shot. As the waiter pulled the trigger, a surprising turn of events unfolded. A chopstick was sent hurtling through the air, piercing the waiter's neck, causing him to collapse to the floor, his life hanging by a thread. Confusion gripped the eight-legged man and the girl as they turned their attention to Peter, who was holding another chopstick. The once-confident girl began to doubt herself, witnessing the lethal precision of Peter's strike. The chopstick had found its mark in the waiter's vital areas, leaving no doubt about Peter's exceptional skill. Unperturbed, Peter casually retrieved two more chopsticks and continued his meal. The eight-legged man couldn't help but be impressed by the assassin's flashy skill. As he walked over to examine the waiter's body, he admired Peter's handiwork and inquired about the club to which the young man belonged. Offering an unexpected proposition, he extended an invitation for Peter to join the Glory Club. Before we continue, let's take a moment to shout out at Dark Whisper 0603 who commented, You have great flow in your story. Telling makes the story intriguing on our Betrayed Isekai video. Thanks for commenting. The eight-legged man feigned friendliness as he approached Peter, his eyes betraying the malevolent intent that simmered beneath his facade. With a sly grin, he swiftly drew his gun unleashing a barrage of bullets that cut through the air with a deadly precision. Peter, however, possessed a quick mind and even quicker reflexes. In a desperate bid for cover, he dove behind a sturdy table, his heart pounding in his chest. The eight-legged man's laughter echoed through the room as the bullets tore through the wooden sanctuary, splinters flying like confetti in a macabre celebration. He taunted Peter, ridiculing the young man for his audacity and thinking a simple table could thwart bullets at such close range. Octopus Head, as he liked to call himself, savored the moment, convinced he had severely wounded his young adversary. In the brief pause that followed, Octopus Head offered Peter a final chance to reveal his connection to the elusive old assassin, curiosity dancing in his eyes, but Peter remained resolute, his silence a testament to his unwavering determination. Octopus Head, growing impatient, made the fateful decision to finish the job once and for all. As he leaned in to confirm the kill, his eyes widened in shock. Instead of the expected crimson pool of blood, a cascade of fiery chili oil spilled from beneath the table, drenching the floor and his shoes. Panic gripped him, his heart racing as he frantically scanned the room for any sign of his elusive opponent. Doubt crept into his mind, a nagging suspicion that he was grappling with a phantom. Suddenly his gaze shot upward, and he beheld a jaw-dropping sight. Peter suspended from a massive pillar, his agile form defying gravity. With calculated precision, the assassin descended upon his prey, his mouth still tingling from the fiery concoction he had concealed. In one fluid motion, he expelled the chili soup onto Octopus Head's face, temporarily blinding him. Seizing the opportunity, Peter unleashed an onslaught of punches that blurred in their ferocity. His first strike found its mark, landing with surgical precision on Octopus Head's arm causing him to cry out in pain as the gun clattered to the ground. The next blow was a thunderous crescendo, a powerful punch that shattered the gun into a cascade of metal fragments. And then, the coup de grace, a devastating smack to Octopus Head's face, a final note in the symphony of violence. Bleeding from the mouth, disoriented and bewildered by the astonishing speed of his youthful opponent, Octopus Head's world spiraled into chaos. Darkness encroached upon his vision, his remaining senses overwhelmed. As he lay there in the disarrayed room, he couldn't help but marvel at the enigma that was Peter. The hitman's thoughts drifted to his own youth, a time of rigorous training when he was groomed to become a formidable adversary. He recalled a mentor's words, planting the seed of a special technique to subdue distracted opponents. And as he lay on the floor, a chilling realization dawned upon him. Peter was not just any opponent, he was a prodigy, a fighter who had honed his own unique technique, one that left Octopus head powerless and gasping for breath begging for mercy. Despite the lethal effectiveness of his technique, Octopus Head's relentless trainers had pushed him to greater extremes. They demanded that he refine his grip to such a degree that it could snuff out the life of his opponent. Over time, he had accomplished just that. His hands became instruments of death, squeezing the life out of adversaries. Still, his trainers had one last lesson to impart. Never turn your back on your opponent even if victory seemed assured. With unwavering determination, Octopus Head had mastered the art of battle awareness, completing his special technique. He was convinced he could never be defeated, yet here he lay in the present, humbled by a young stranger's skill. He refused to accept defeat, for he knew that one only truly lost when they stayed down. Octopus Head was not one to stay down. Before Peter could make his exit, the fallen hitman seized his leg with lightning speed. In an instant, he coiled around Peter, executing his signature move. He twisted Peter's body, constricting his airway until breathing became a struggle. A vice-like chokehold turned Peter's face a ghastly shade of purple, the result of dwindling blood and oxygen. Amid the tightening grip, Octopus Head taunted Peter, boasting of his lifelong dedication to this brutal profession. 
his experience outweighing Peter's youth and inexperience. He believed himself the superior combatant, unaware of Peter's own fifty years within the organization. In his arrogance, Octopus Head yelled for Peter to die, but an unexpected voice shattered his delusion. Someone called out, drawing his attention. He looked up in confusion, only to find the very person he thought he had been strangling standing before him. Unscathed, his disbelief was compounded when he glanced back at the one he had wrapped himself around, realizing that it was his subordinate who had met his demise from a simple chopstick to the neck. What will happen next? Find out next time by staying tuned for our future recaps. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great recaps.